Are there belief systems or ideologies or ideas out there that you think are harmful? And if so, are those ideas gaining steam? What is the solution to this problem? Because I think a lot of the ways that people are trying to approach the problem are actually making the situation worse. And I would like to approach this problem humbly because I know a lot of the important ideas that we need if we're going to have a just society, those ideas are often trapped inside small, disempowered communities. So if we shut off ideas from those communities from bubbling up to places of power, we're almost certainly going to have a less just society. Here's my approach for this video. First, I'm going to talk about two dysfunctional approaches to solving this problem, where I define dysfunction as a situation where applying effort to solve the problem actually makes it worse. Then I'm going to lay out a framework about how knowledge gets transferred between groups that I think will help us think about what could a real effective solution be. Then I'll talk about some specific actions we can take as individuals, as communities and as the writers of these algorithms. The first dysfunctional approach is to shower people with contempt if they have those bad, harmful ideas. And first I want to talk about why this might seem like a reasonable approach, and then I'll talk about why I think this is definitely backfiring. So I like to do thought experiments where we rewind to hunter-gatherer societies or early agricultural societies and think about what would work socially in a group of say 100, 150 people. And in that situation, contempt actually is probably a pretty good approach. The cost of getting contempt from the group is possible starvation, possibly being ousted from the group. There are just really high existential consequences of getting the contempt treatment from your tribe. So in that setting, Contempt is a marvelous approach to getting people to behave well, getting people to not talk about ideas that are going to harm other people in the group. So the intuition on this one, I think, is well-grounded. The problem is when contempt is coming from someone outside your group, someone perhaps on an opposing tribe, that contempt simply raises the threat level of that group to you. So once again, we could imagine a bunch of different tribes that coexist on some land and their neighbors, maybe they exchange with each other occasionally, but they are different tribes. Those tribes are going to have to think about which tribes from among those around me are threats to us. Which tribes do we need to protect ourselves from? If they're approaching us from a distance, do we need to get our weapons out? You have to come to some sort of agreement as a community about which tribes are threats. And if a particular tribe holds you in contempt, that's a pretty good indication that that tribe views you as a threat. And contempt, of course, is associated with disgust. It's associated with disease and vermin and all of that kind of stuff. So when you view someone with contempt, you are actually in some ways viewing them as a literal physical threat to you and your community. If another tribe views you as a threat, then that tribe might be preparing to get rid of you in some way. In which case, the result in this hunter-gatherer tribe society is for that group, anytime they approach, you need to get your armor up, you need to get your weapons, and you might consider going to war on them to prevent whatever hostility they're going to aim at you. So with that analogy, we start to imagine that group that group with the bad, harmful ideas, their response to your contempt is probably not going to be, oh, I need to fall in line, I need to um, f adhere to the social guidelines of the person with the contempt. Their response is going to be to, to villainize you, to feel that you are a sense of threat to them, which could come with sort of an escalating contempt cycle. The second dysfunctional response to someone with bad ideas is to try to limit their rights in some way. 
and oftentimes this is their rights to participate in social communities online. It can be other types of rights as well, but this is sort of the direct coercion method. And the reason this is really dysfunctional in the current environment is because when you start to take away people's rights, they feel very, very threatened by you. They're going to sort of get up in arms, they're going to prepare to protect themselves. This sort of puts them in threat mode where you are the enemy. And when we limit people's rights, the result is our social media feeds, as the people limiting their rights, our social media feeds tell us what we want to hear. So our social media feeds tell us, you put them in their place, they're having to calm down, you've neutralized this threat. You're the hero for promoting that limiting of their rights. Meaning, what's so dangerous about this in the social media era is that the people who are limiting the rights are really, really out of touch with the response from the other side. This would be a different scenario and I would be saying different things if there were accurate information about reality moving between groups. So if you tried to limit the rights of a particular group and you actually saw, oh, wait a second, by limiting their rights, they're actually gaining more followers. They're taking up people under their bad ideas with these, uh, this new banner. If you actually saw that, you might be like, whoa, let's not do that again. Let's take a different approach. I don't want to add steam to that movement. But instead, your social media feed just sort of feeds you what feels good and you're less and less aware of what's going on on the other side. Now, one other thing I'll point out but I won't say much about because I talk about it extensively in many other videos is the fact that the social media algorithms that are trying to maximize engagement on platform, I think they've figured out that this sort of contempt, contempt cycle and this sort of escalating threat between groups I think they've figured out that that is lucrative. Therefore, there's ways social media can incentivize more of that kind of content, leading to this escalation of hostility. Enough said about that. Okay, now I would like to give a framework for thinking about a better approach. And I'm going to call this the overlapping social bubbles approach. There's three parts to this framework, and the first part is simply the idea that we exist in overlapping social bubbles. So you know that you have a group of people who are a lot like you, who think like you, and especially who receive social media feeds similar to yours. As a matter of fact, the social media algorithms probably know your social bubble way better than you do. But we also know that these social bubbles overlap. Now we know that information and ideas and challenges to ideas are going to be most effectively transferred inside your social bubble. Those are the people who speak your language, they understand what motivates you, they, they have the tools needed to have really good rhetoric to change your mind. So you can probably see where I'm going with this. The basic idea is if you imagine your social bubble and you imagine way over there is the social bubble of the people who have harmful ideas according to your perspective. There are going to be overlapping social bubbles that connect those two groups. And you might imagine even the idea of social distance, which I think we need to start talking more about that concept of social distance. Their social distance from you is really, really large. There, there's a huge social distance, but it's not an infinite social distance. There are a certain number of overlapping bubbles of people in between you and them. So. If you actually believe that their beliefs are harmful, you should be rooting for the people who are near their social bubble or in their social bubble to challenge their bad ideas. You should be rooting for those people who could actually influence how they think to challenge the way they think. Now, of course, you can tell what's actually happening is that because there's so much contempt flying around, what you're doing is you're alienating the people who could change their minds. Now, because social media has decided that contempt is the gold of the new era, contempt is the stuff that gets people to engage, 
What's actually happening is when a group views another group's beliefs as harmful, they start to throw contempt that direction, including contempt toward the very people who could change their minds. So we imagine the purple people have harmful ideas, and they overlap a little bit with the magenta people, right? The magenta people and the purple people have some shared understandings of the world, shared beliefs, shared values. They support each other for the most part. And you're over here in the orange people category saying, we need to stop those purple people's ideas. They truly harm the world. And you know that there are some people in the magenta group who also agree with you on that, who see the purple people's ideas as being truly harmful. What you want to do is you want to empower and enable those magenta people to interact with, change the minds of, and open the minds of the purple people to seeing how harmful those ideas are. That's what you really want. What's actually happening is the orange people are looking at that and they're saying, those magenta people, they're way too close to those purple people. Those are bad people. Throw contempt toward them. Anyone in that realm is just a bad person. That's what's happening. It's causing the magenta people to bleed into the purple group and the purple group to expand. So the, the point here is that if we think of information travel as traveling through these social bubbles. That framework will help us understand how do we actually solve some of these problems. Now the second piece to this framework is the fact that the boundaries of these bubbles are actually really flexible. As a matter of fact, people learn new information over time. They adopt new social bubbles. The social boundaries sort of switch over time. And this fluid process of expanding and contracting boundaries of your social bubble, that's part of what makes up the drama and the movement on social media. And then the third part of this framework is the part that I think is most related to humility. It's the idea that if we have a spectrum from mainstream to fringe, both of those two groups actually have information that's essential to the other. Now let's compare the values of these two groups. So mainstream is going to be the parts of society that are well rewarded by society. So this is people at the top of businesses, this is people at the top of uh, academic circles, it's people at the top of government, where the way you work up through those hierarchies has different parts to it. And some of those parts, I'm not saying 100% of those parts, but some of the mechanisms for people to move up inside these systems are related to competence. It's related to sort of mastery of complicated ideas mastery of skills and techniques and vocabulary. These systems are designed to make sure the very most competent people reach the top. However, we also need to acknowledge that one of the ways that you move up inside any system is basically by sucking up to the people above you on the hierarchy. And this is how entrenchment happens. Basically, the ideas that are best for the people in power that are best for the people who already have money, already have status inside the system, those ideas are going to be adopted by people who want to climb to the top of those hierarchies. So at the top, we have a high level of competence combined with a high level of what some might describe as corruption. And I would also describe this as corruption, but I don't think this is necessarily the classic way people think about corruption. Because the people moving up in these systems, I don't think they're aware that they're adopting ideas that are keeping the powerful in power. They just sort of hear these from competent people above them in the hierarchy that they respect. And they think about those ideas a lot more than they think about ideas that contradict these ideas. And therefore, they, they truly believe these ideas without realizing that the mechanisms by which they adopted them help keep powerful people in power. So if we think of the mainstream side of this social bubble circle, it's highly competent 
and highly corrupt or highly protective of ideas that keep people in power. That's one side of the social bubble's circle. On the other side of this social bubble interconnection spectrum, we have the fringe. And on one hand, you don't have people in the fringe who rose within the ranks of power. You don't have the scientists, the successful business people. You don't have people who are connected to the, the parts of society that determine validity. And therefore, there's probably a lot more invalid ideas bouncing around that fringe. However, that fringe also contains some of the very most important ideas for disrupting corrupt power structures. Like any idea that would change the balance of power is probably not going to make it into the mainstream. Facts about the experiences of people who live on the fringes, people who are marginalized, people who did not succeed in working their way up inside the system, those people's experiences and the realities of those experiences, those are probably going to be trapped in the fringe. In a just society, you would have a clear line of communication between these groups, such that the people in power did a good job of thinking about the experiences and viewpoints and all of that stuff of the people on the fringes, on the margins of society. And the, the worse that this line of communication is, the more society is going to have a tendency to move towards injustice. So both of these sides have value, both should want to connect with each other, but both sides also have a lot of invalid ideas bouncing around inside them. That's my framework. In which case, let me give you a few specific approaches to solving this problem of harmful, dangerous ideas. The first approach is to stop trying to change the minds of people with high social distance from you. Like if you are on one side of an issue and someone many, many social bubbles away from you has a viewpoint that you think is harmful to society, you are not the person to do that. Let someone else do that and support the groups that could change their minds. This also involves acknowledging that when your group does things to try to solve the problem, to try to address those people's bad beliefs, what you're likely to get is a distorted view of reality about the effects of that. Your social bubbles like to hear that their actions are doing good in the world, that when they try to solve a problem, it's working. So your social media feeds are going to feed you content that tells you it's working. This first approach involves not only stopping trying to change them, trying to change it from your social vantage point, but also acknowledging that the feedback loop of reality is way distorted by social media algorithm incentives. The second approach to this problem is for each individual to try to expand the boundaries along which you can speak to people. This isn't the boundaries of your own beliefs, this is the boundaries along which you can speak respectfully, the boundaries along which you can have a productive conversation with someone who thinks differently than you. And the, the most likely situation is that you can speak pretty well across difference to people in overlapping social bubbles to you. Those people have a slightly different viewpoint from yourself but they use similar language, they have similar concepts. So when you talk to them, that's very invigorating for the two of you because you're learning from each other, you respect each other's beliefs, but there's enough difference to make that conversation interesting. If you can expand the bubble of people for which you can have a two-way conversation where both of you are learning from each other, then good ideas are going to travel more quickly through this bubble of interlocking social networks. And the more people who can have these conversations across bubbles, across bubbles especially more distant from themselves, the, the more quickly and the more effectively good ideas will spread and bad ideas will be challenged. So that's one that you can actually do personally. This doesn't require rearranging society or reprogramming the algorithms to make this work. 
The third approach we can take when we recognize that there is a group with harmful beliefs is to root for the people who are closer to them in their social bubbles. So you know that there are groups of people with a much shorter social distance to them who also see the problem with their beliefs, who also might be able to talk them down from their beliefs in a respectful two-way conversation. Rooting for those people to do that is really important. Now, you might ask, how does rooting for people make any difference? Like, does the fans rooting for a team actually impact their probability of winning? And of course, some people might argue no, and some people might argue yes because of the positive social energy or whatever. What I would argue is that when you start to root for those groups, you start to treat them differently. You start to make way for those groups to have higher social status and higher power in a way that um, lifts them up and actually does give them more power, especially socially. So I think in the social media realm, rooting for someone in your head and in your heart can have real effects in terms of how things play out. And I could probably talk more about that, but I'm just trying to lay out some basic, basic approaches. Now let me talk a little bit about how algorithms and different forms of social media might enable this. The first thing, obviously, is that we need to have algorithms that reward respectful conversation across social bubbles. So when I say you personally should try to expand your reach of people that you can have a respectful conversation with where you both learn from each other. That's an interpersonal value, but that value could be promoted by the algorithms. And to the degree that it is, I think the quality of people's information, the quality of people's understanding about the truths of the world would rise dramatically if the algorithms could socially reward people who are really good at this. The second thing we need to change about our algorithms is the fact that they promote threat-based, clickbaity types of content that are going to promote behaviors related to contempt, promote behaviors that will be threatening between groups. I talk a lot about this elsewhere, so I won't go into detail about that point, but I do think this will be an essential part of the process. You know what, this video is probably long enough, so I think I'll stop there. I could come up with a lot more potential solutions than that, but the point here is that we need to start supporting the entire information ecosystem, and we need to be aware of the distortions that we get from the vantage point of our social bubbles if we really truly want to address some of the harmful things going on in society.